The committee will come back to order. Um, thank you all for uh, accommodating our vote series. Um, that should be the end of the vote series today. Um, as, as I understand it, uh, Chairman Grunberg, uh, you'd like to correct the record? If I may, Mr. Chairman, thank you. You asked me a question earlier, and just for to be specific and for clarification, in 2008, I was interviewed pursuant to a review done in response to a concern raised by an employee, and I'm not aware of anything that came out of that review. But since you asked the question earlier, I just wanted to respond clearly for the record and we'd be glad to provide you any additional information relating okay. to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for consulting with council and, and coming back and correcting the record. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? I'm just I'm trying, to, trying to be lighthearted. Um, all right. Uh, we'll get back to order here. Next up is the uh, investigation subcommittee chair, uh, Mr. Heisinga of Michigan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Grunberg. I, I appreciate that clarification. Um, you know, you, you've had a long career at the FDIC, uh, a long career in Congress I, as a staffer uh, in the Senate side, um, as a former staffer myself. I know sometimes uh, that, that that's both good and bad. Uh, but uh, I was going to ask, and am going to continue to ask, uh, you know, m much of those incidents that were reported in the Wall Street Journal happened under your watch directly. Uh, 2011 to 2018 was your first go around at FDIC as chair. Uh, the, uh, the article listed uh, incidents in 2013, 2015, 2017, 2018. Were you made aware of those of the misconduct that was going on at the time referenced in those articles when you were chairman? Um, no, Congressman. When cases like that come up in which there is a complaint filed and then a review done, an investigation done, and a disciplinary action taken, that would be done through our legal division. And so, so the legal division does not talk to you at all. Does that seem right to you? That seems a little odd to me. I think the notion is that to the extent these were adjudicatory matters between employees, the board is generally kept out of that. Okay, the, uh, I think the real question and the assertion behind this article is the systemic element of this. Um, you know, you initiated an independent review after that article came out, that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, the, uh, the, in your opening, you said you have no higher priority than ensuring FDIC employees work in a safe environment and feel valued. Uh, to ranking members waters, you responded that you, uh, you want to hold individuals accountable and, quote, will be entirely transparent. Uh, you weren't really transparent earlier. You've corrected the record uh, now on that. I'm not going to ask you the, some of the salacious things that Senator Kennedy did, uh, but I, I, I do intend to ask you um, to, to clarify and amplify what, uh, what happened, I think, as you said, in, in 2028. Uh, you know, because, Mr. Chairman, my experience is that, uh, a, 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 no, it was 2008 uh, was the, was the uh, but my experience is that uh, culture starts at the very top. And um, so you're saying that there was some accusation and review and presumably a report of some behavior, is that, Correct. Was there a report that was that was issued? I believe so, uh, Congressman. Okay, and you'd be willing to share that? Have us be able to go into the legal department and HR sure. and IG and whoever else we need to talk to? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, was there an NDAA signed with that or a settlement that was uh, that was a part of that? No, sir. So there was no cash settlement. There was no non-disclosure that came out of that. No. So we could talk to whoever made the accusation as well. Yes. All right. Um, well, I appreciate that. Um, uh, we, uh, we will intend to do that. So uh, thank you for that clarification. My remaining time, I, I want to turn to uh, uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, yesterday, along with my colleagues, Representative Muser and Representative Mooney, we sent you a letter about the totality of the rules currently being proposed or finalized by the Federal Reserve and other regulators. This is something that we talk with, uh, with the chair of the SEC on a regular basis about. 
Uh, as as a, a quick example, Basel II rule is more than a thousand pages long with very little of it focused on the aggregate effect of these proposals on the ability of financial institutions to serve their customers and to support economic growth. Do you or anyone at the Fed for that matter have a sense of the cumulative impact of the massive number of regulations that have been recently finalized or that are in the pipeline and what they will have on consumers' access to, to bank loan products. And if you're not familiar with the letter, I've got a copy here. I, I know it was sent yesterday. Um, I, I did uh, take a look at the letter uh, very quickly. Um, so I, I don't have a, a detailed response to you, but uh, we do look at the effect overall of our rules. We don't anticipate that the effect of the capital rules that we've proposed are going to have what? a significant effect on credit conditions, on, on and, lending and in the United States. Who, who is actually doing that? Who's giving that serious thought about all these changes that are going to happen at the same time and somehow you know, banks and how they fit into the, that economy? Is that you? Do you, have a, do you have economists that are looking at it? Who is actually providing that analysis? I'm, I'm ultimately uh, responsible for that. I, I do have many staff people who are working on analysis of all and, of And will you share, and I think this was something that was pursued yesterday at the Senate, will you share that analysis with us? Not just what you put in the report, but the actual analysis that leads you to those conclusions. Will you provide that to us? That is what we've asked for repeatedly. The analysis that is in the proposal is the analysis that supported the rule. We'll, of course, continue to do that work. We're gathering comments and information. We will analyze that, and we'll make that's, that information. That's not the answer. But uh, I, I'm glad to hear we're going to have 15-day responses, Mr. Chairman, So uh, as we've had with the ranking member. We look forward to hearing from those. Well, the rankers, uh, ranking member set the, uh, the tempo. Uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you probably don't get a lot of a lot of this, but I, I, I want, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, FDIC uh, for the work that you've done on uh, CRA. Uh, I've had a chance to meet with all, uh, all of you to uh, discuss my concerns and also uh, look for ways in which uh, CRA could be updated and, and, and be a, a um, more of a factor in affordable housing. And uh, I appreciate all of the, the work that, that uh, you have done, uh, the collaboration that, that has occurred. Uh, and uh, I am excited about it. Uh, as you know, the Trump administration, um, uh, the OCC had attempted to unilaterally impose a harmful rule that would have undermined the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, and it would have been just a, a paper a tiger in terms of its ability to combat modern day redlining. So thank you very much for, for all of the hard work that, that you've done. I appreciate it very much. I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, I, I, I'm probably the foremost expert on monsters uh, in Congress. Um, I've studied them all. Uh, and uh, Frankenstein, of course, is, is unique. Uh, Mary Shelley brought, cre created him in the, in the early 1800s. Uh, it's a gothic novel. I don't, I don't want to go into too, too much detail. Uh, I know you're interested, but I, uh, I'm not going to you know, go into detail. Um, you know, they he, uh, Mary Ke uh, Kelly, uh, Shelley uh, talks about how this monster was created uh, and, and made, and then turned on the villagers. Uh, and about 15 years ago, the chairman, the ranking member, and I were here when Frankenstein walked through that door, right this one, and told us we were on the verge of a worldwide economic collapse. Uh, and we had created that monster by uh, lackadaisical uh, uh, views of what was going on with the big banks. And uh, so he came in to, to wreak havoc. And then um, a few months ago, the Silicon Valley Bank caused me to think that people are trying to put together, piece back together, Frankenstein again. Um, I, I think if, we, if, if banks are insufficiently capitalized, particularly these folk banks that, that are just get, uh, dealing with these tech companies, these startups, uh, they can create Frankenstein. I just want to find out from you if you think that uh, 
the banks are sufficiently capitalized and that Frankenstein is not going to return. No, the, the next book was The Return of Frankenstein. I mean, you didn't, probably didn't know that. But. Thank you very much for the question. I, I do think overall that the banking system is sound. We have identified areas um, that are in our capital proposal where we think uh, banks should uh, be more resilient even than they are now. Um, we hope to uh, see these uh, proposals um, through the comment process uh, to, to gather information, to learn more about what people uh, uh, think about the capital rules. But in general, we think these risks um, are, are not appropriately addressed with risk calibration in our current approach, and they could be improved. So are you saying that, that, that the Silicon Valley issue, those three large regional banks um, that, in my estimation, you know, could have brought, started bringing down this economy again. Or, or, or are you all saying that that's not going to happen, that everything is, is now at a level, even though the, the large banks, about it, as, as you probably know, uh, are on the low end of, of what is socially optimal in terms of the balance, uh, the cost, and, and uh, benefits to prevent uh, this such a thing in the future. So even though th th they're, they're dropping, you're still comfortable. I, I think in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, the, the depositors looked at the bank and judged it to be insolvent. Um, and one of the steps that we we're taking in this capital rule is to provide a rule that says unrealized losses uh, on available for sale securities need to be included in capital. Uh, so that provision of this package would address um, the concerns in that particular case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, we'll now go to uh, the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, your Basel III endgame proposal would significantly increase capital requirements on the capital markets activities of the largest U.S. financial institutions. These increases will negatively impact U.S. banks' ability to conduct critical market-making activities, harming further the U.S. economy. Considering that the largest U.S. banks make up roughly 50% of securities underwriting, what specific analysis did you conduct to determine the impact that your proposal would have on securities underwriting? Uh, thank you very much for the question. The analysis and the rule supports a better risk calibration of a range of trading uh, activities that the largest banks conduct. The risk calibration would make those banks more resilient uh, so that they're able to actually provide the services that you described that are so vital for our economy. We are open to comment um, from banks uh, and from the public. If they believe that the risk calibration is not correct, we very much welcome comment on it. Well, I think that everyone thinks it's not correct. Your proposal would also limit U.S. banks ability to participate in derivatives, securitization, and securities lending. Why place these punitive capital requirements on the trading desks of banks? Uh, thank you very much for the question. What, what we have um, uh, learned over the course of uh, uh, seeing the experience of how banks manage these risks is that some of these risks can cause uh, serious losses to the banking sector and harm the American economy. Uh, as we saw in the global financial crisis. So we want to make sure that all the activities a bank undertakes, including the activities that you described, that those are done in a safe and sound way. And capital is the absolutely essential element to have to make sure that banks are operating safely. And your proposal is going to limit that greatly. You know, access to credit, or loans essentially, is a key driver of the innovative and competitive nature of the American economy. Credit helps start businesses. It allows them to grow and, it, and to invest in, in anything from new equipment, facilities, technology. It helps create jobs that would not have existed otherwise. Chairman Gruenberg, do you agree that the Basel III endgame proposal will lead, uh, as, as we've you've even heard from left-leaning and progressive commentators, to higher costs of credit and less credit availability for low-income and traditionally underserved communities. Thank you. For, <clears throat> thank you for the for the question, Congresswoman. 
Um, uh, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that this is a proposed rule, that we're receiving comment on a range of these issues, and we'll certainly give them careful consideration, and I certainly expect... In I'm the, aware of that. Could you answer yeah, my so, question? So I think we're going to address some of the concerns raised specifically on the credit side in the rule, in, in the final rulemaking. Very concerned about the credit side yeah. and, and, and availability for, for literally the low-income and traditionally underserved communities no, here. I, and that's been, if I may say, particularly raised in regard to the risk weights for mortgages. Yep. Uh, we've received comments on that. We actually have language in the preamble discussing that issue with alternatives to be considered that we're seeking comment on. And that'll be a focus of attention in the final. I hope so. Vice Chair Barr, the U.S. implementation of the Fundamental Review of Trading Book, the FRTB, along with the global market shock component of the Fed stress tests are essentially a double count, a double count of capital requirements, forcing U.S. banks to have enough market risk capital to survive two financial crises in a row, whereas European banks only must have enough market risk capital for one. Does the Federal Reserve believe that U.S. markets are twice as risky as Europe or that European banks are undercapitalized? Uh, thank you for the question. The uh, proposal does not uh, double count um, risks in the banking system. The risk-weighted ASCET proposal that we use uh, under this uh, proposal is used to set minimum capital levels, and the stress test is used to set a stress capital buffer. Those are done independently. It's, it is not a, in my but judgment, cumulatively, it is a double count. You've got the Fed stress test, Along with with the uh, with the 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 the, the FRTB, I, I, it is uh, a double count for U.S. banks and puts us in a competitive disadvantage, sir. As, as under our current rules, the risk weighted approach, the static approach, is used to set minimum requirements, and the stress test is used to measure the stress capital buffer. My my not, time, my not time is expired, uh, but I I hope you're going to take this into consideration because you are putting us at extreme competitive disadvantage with Europe. I yield back to Sharon. If the uh, witness would answer for the record. Uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Vargas, for your perennial graciousness. Um, uh, so I appreciate the work that all of you are doing on the, on the Basel proposals. Um, obviously, we're keen to see the final details, but uh, I am generally supportive of a robust and well-capitalized um, banking sector. But I, I do have some concerns I want to raise about the tax equity provisions, specifically as they relate to clean energy. Um, I see some heads nodding, so hopefully this is not new information for any of you, but the, just for, for the millions of viewers we have right now, um, <laughs> the, uh, the proposed rule would quadruple the capital requirements for banks that make tax equity investments. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about that as it may frustrate the intent of the Inflation Reduction Act since the clean energy provisions relied so heavily on tax credits. Chairman Grunberg, Mr. Shu, Vice Chair Barr, I think I see you nodding, but you're all familiar with this provision of the proposal? Yes? Okay, the record will show vigorously nodding heads. Did, can, you, can any of you speak, did you contemplate the renewable energy development consequences when you were developing those those provisions of the clean energy tax equity credits. Would anybody like to comment? I, I'd be happy to um, to address the the question. So we we don't have special provisions um, in the capital rules for different kinds of um, different kinds of either renewable energy credits or other other types of things. The tax credits are treated the same as other private. Uh, equity investments. Now, we are open to receiving public comment on this. We've heard a lot uh, already about it. The kinds of comments, you know, people have been saying to us, which are the kinds of comments that are appropriate for us to take into account, is that these types of uh, instruments have lower risk than other equity investments because the investor is repaid through the proceeds of the tax credit. Uh, okay. That's the I kind of evidence that we would consider in okay. thinking about whether the calibration is appropriate. Okay, I, I'm, I want to agree with the second half of what you said and just challenge the first half a little bit because under the proposal, the tax credits for low, if you use tax credits, if you use tax equity to fund tax credits for low-income community housing support, there is no change in the risk weighting from the current 100% level. 
if you use tax equity to fund tax credits for clean energy development, there's a four times increase in risk weighting. So, so I, would, I would challenge the assertion that all tax equity is treated the same way. There are some differences within the tax equity universe. Yes, there is a separate statutory provision with respect to low-income housing tax credits that, that are treated um, okay. differently under the rule for that reason. Okay, well, let me, let me come back to that because, Mr. Shu, I just want to um, clarify something with you. In, the, um, in 2021, the OCC established cri specific criteria for tax equity that said that tax equity investments are, quote, the functional equivalent of a loan in order to qualify under OCC guidance. Do I have that right from the 2021 OCC guidance? I think so, but I'd like to get back to you on that. Uh, okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm reading from a report that the OCC issued that essentially said in order for tax equity to be treated, it had to be the functional equivalent of a loan. So it, it seems like at, under OCC guidance, that's already been established as the, as the comparable point. Um, Mr. Grimberg, you had something you wanted to add? I d just wanted to uh, to comment that um, in terms of the um, um, renewable energy renewable energy tax credit, I think this is a pretty good example of the value of a comment period. You know, I don't, I'm not sure in crafting the proposed rule, we fully appreciated the impact okay. here, and I think the feedback we've received has been helpful, and I think will that's great. Influence the final. Well, I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear that, and I I just hope you will all commit to considering alternatives that that accurately reflect the risk and are consistent with prior OCC guidance. I see heads nodding on that as well, so I'm glad to hear. Last thing I want to raise in the little time we've got left in talking with clean energy developers and talking with banks, we are hearing that banks are already starting to slow down their investments in the in in clean energy in this space because they are anxious about the potential need to build capital reserves. Um, I'm curious if you all are hearing that in 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 the pushback because we're certainly hearing it from the industry. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, for what it's worth, I, I have not heard that, but. Can, okay, well, I, I hope that shows up in the comment record then, and not just people calling their friendly member of Congress um, to push back on it. But I, I, I raised that just in the time because I understand you've got a process, I understand there's a phase in to go through, but given, given the slowdown the already, an affirmative statement of intent earlier on would be very helpful. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, yield back. We'll now go to the chair of the Small Business Committee, Mr. Uh, Williams of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here today. And I'm a small business owner from Texas. 52 years I've been in business. I'm a car dealer. Every day I've been involved, I, I, I owe money to a bank every single day for all that period of time. And I'm really worried about where we're taking our banking system uh, that would affect Main Street. I'm worried about my bank having being able to loan me money when I need it. So over the last year, our nation's federal banking agencies have been bombarding our financial system with excessive regulations and dangerous proposals like Basel III, long-term debt requirements, and climate risk management standards. It's also alarming that our banking agencies are rolling out these types of proposals in a rushed fashion without considering how these combined regulations and requirements might impact innovation, limit access to capital for Main Street for small business, and threaten economic stability. So Vice Chair Barr, uh, you uh, uh, claim that Basel III proposals contain a meaningful analysis. Uh, however, from what I see, the Basel proposal is over a thousand pages long, and less than 20 of those pages cover an economic analyst analysis. So given that proposal will overlap with numerous other existing requirements, I find these 20 pages insufficient for a complex proposal like Basel. So why do you keep ignoring Congress's request for a full economic analysis? Uh, I believe that the proposal contains economic analysis that supports the rule. We obviously are open for and welcome to comments. Uh, happy to receive analysis um, if people disagree with us and to take that into account in our normal uh, notice and comment rulemaking process. Now, I've been actively working with members on this committee and the Committee on Small Business uh, to be the voice for Main Street in the rulemaking process. Main Street America, the whole, what our country is all about. And Mr. Barr, early this year, I sent you a letter with my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, uh, which expressed our legitimate concerns that Basel III will significantly impact America's ability to access reliable credit and increase overall borrowing costs. In a time where interest rates are already making it harder for small business to access capital, this proposal would be disastrous 
uh, and couple it with the economy we got now, it would stop things. So again, to you, uh, Vice Chair, will you abandon the pr uh, provisions calling for elimination of banks' use of supervised internal models in determining capital requirements? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we, we do not believe that the proposal will have a significant effect on credit, on credit conditions. Most of the proposal deals with trading and other non-lending activity. Small banks are not part of this proposal. Uh, they're responsible for doing lots of small business lending. And even with respect to the small business lending that big banks are doing, the proposal keeps the current approach with respect to capital treatment uh, for small banks and provides some uh, opportunity to get a lower risk weight uh, if bank, small bank lending is part of a diversified portfolio, for example. So we, we do not anticipate the kind of effects that you're describing, but we are, of course, open in the comment period to hearing that. If we need to make adjustments to our approach, we're very open to doing that if, if it's supported by uh, the analysis that we get. Well, a good analysis is talking to Main Street America. The banks are nervous. The banks are already getting scared to death of this. So the Federal Reserve recently released the Community Reinvestment Act rule, which was nearly 1,500 pages. This is a massive overhaul for smaller banks in my district that do not have the legal and compliance teams to deal with the undertaking that comes with 1,500 page rule. Community banks are already struggling under the current regulatory agenda. We should not be adding more burdensome rules that will increase compliance costs. They're hiring more compliance officers than our loan officers. Again, that affects Main Street. We should be focused on allowing these banks to thrive, not trying to regulate them to death and frankly, let them compete. So quickly, uh, Mr. Grunberg, uh, could you explain how federal banking agencies are working to educate smaller community banks on compliance and not just throw a thousand plus page rule at them and expect them to perfectly comply? Because what will happen, like all small businesses, they will decide to get smaller rather than bigger because they fear all these regulations. And then again, that affects Main Street, that affects me, and then it affects people being able to hire people, et cetera. So could you please answer that question? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Congressman, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we were quite sensitive in the, in the Community Reinvestment Act rulemaking to its impact on community banks. So all community banks with assets under 600 million, which is over 3,000 community banks, will have no regulatory change from their current treatment under CRA. The new rulemaking will not impact them at all. <clears throat> and for banks between 600 million and 2 billion, which is frankly covers most of the additional uh, community banks, um, they would have only a marginal change and no additional record keeping. So I think as a general proposition for banks under 2 billion, which is the large majority of community banks in the United States, there should not be a Gentlemen's time's expired. Time's up. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, it's good to see you again. Um, you're sensing and hearing a lot of confusion on the part of members around um, the proposed rule. Uh, I want to limit my comments to the question of additional capital, um, and I'm going to hand you the bulk of my time, but I want to guide how you answer this. Um, we're in a world of confusion here. We saw a governor's vote that was split. We heard the chairman himself uh, elucidate some, some very serious concerns. The first line of your testimony today was our banking system is sound and resilient. Um, and so a lot of us are struggling to see the clear need for additional capital. And by the way, having lived through 09, 2010, if that need is clear, you will have an ally sitting right here on that issue. But we're struggling to see the need um, and I heard what you said to the chairman. It was kind of, it's in there in the preamble. I've read the preamble a whole bunch of times. It refers both to quantitative impact studies as well as to the preponderance of literature. Um, this committee, you know, we deal with flood insurance. I'm struggling for analogies here. This committee is used to seeing proposed FEMA flood maps where in a hundred year flood, and we get what a hundred year flood is, the water gets to here and that's bad because this house is there. I think we need that kind of specificity. Um, y y you know, you will have, I guess, run scenarios. And I'm thinking of those flood maps. And what we really need to hear is that if we saw, you know, conditions that mimicked 75% of the adverse change in 08, this is what would happen. So um, again, uh, just to guide the three minutes I'm about to hand you, 
it would really be great to hear described in terms that we can understand it, the quantitative indications, but also save a little bit of time to talk about uh, the um, academic literature. Academic literature can be supported, it can be chosen to support lots of things. So give us a sense for how we can have confidence that that academic literature uh, also supports the case for additional capital. Thank you very much for the question and the opportunity. And start with the, the broad frame. As you know, capital is, is really key to a resilient banking system, one that can serve households and businesses both in good times and in bad times. Banks with strong capital lend more um, throughout the economic cycle, and capital helps to prevent financial crises and to mitigate their impact. Financial crises can crush American households and shutter American small businesses. The costs of a financial crisis uh, range from 20% to 100% of GDP, or 5 trillion to 25 trillion for the United States. The proposal we put forward focuses on stronger capital rules for trading and other non-lending activities where banks have had la large losses. Operational risk capital covers risks from the loss, for example, from rogue traders, from fraud, from other illegal activity and securitizations illegal sales practices, brokerage, and other activities where banks have had large losses. On the trading side, uh, banks have had significant uh, losses from trading and other derivatives activities. Uh, in the global financial crisis, as you know, for example, in just one quarter of the global financial crisis, banks lost $38 billion from their trading and derivatives activities. So on the credit side, uh, the, the approach takes a standardized but risk-sensitive approach uh, to credit. We don't believe that that will result in significant changes uh, overall on the credit side uh, of the House. Uh, if you look overall at the proposal, it's about a two percentage point uh, increase in, in required capital. 30 basis points, or 0.3% of that, uh, relates to credit. That would translate for an average loan uh, to about a 0.03 percentage point increase uh, in funding if all of the cost of that additional capital were passed through. If there were no competition at all, that's what the result uh, would be. Overall, we think that this uh, uh, approach is a reasonable one. Because of management buffers, most banks already meet the capital requirements today. The ones that don't could build capital within two years while maintaining dividends. So in our judgment, the proposal makes the capital system more consistent, more transparent, more risk sensitive. At the same time, we recognize people have different views. That's why we're Mr. Barr, today. let me cut you off because I, I only have 20 seconds left. I hear everything you just said, and I understand. I've been through a bunch of these crises. I understand that more capital will make a more safe system. What I, what I, and, and, and to some extent, the burden's on the regulator. If you start your testimony with our banking system is sound and resilient, period, no comma, but we, we didn't hear articulated what we're so hungry for, which is why the optimal capital proposal involves considerably more capital. And I would just ask you, please, just to sort of try to resolve some of the arguments here to provide whatever quantitative analysis indicates that more capital would be better. Thank uh, you. And yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. A gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I thank all of our witnesses for your patience as we were voting. Uh, I'm glad this resulted in me uh, getting to make it this far into the queue. Um, you know, we spent a little bit of time already talking about um, the amount of reserves that are being required. But, Mr. Barr, my question is for the Federal Reserve, do you consider payment of interest on excess reserves Monetary policy or regulatory policy? Uh, just, just to clarify, the, the proposal we have in front of us with respect to Basel is not a, a proposal that would increase reserves in any way. It's about... That, not, not my question. Cap, I'm sorry. Not my question. My question is, when the Federal Reserve pays interest on excess reserves, which they do, um, over and above what they're requiring, they pay interest on it for the deposits, do you consider that monetary policy or regulatory policy? It's, it's uh, clearly monetary policy. All right, thanks for your interpretation. Uh, what is the status of your work on central bank digital currencies? 
Uh, we're in a very early phase of uh, research exploring different aspects of central bank digital currency. We've not made any um, decision at all about whether to recommend uh, a retail central bank digital currency. If we were to have such a recommendation, we would come see the Congress and the executive branch uh, to, to get your uh, authorization to proceed. Yeah, so not only is it not authorized, I guess I took notice, and a lot of people did, when the Federal Reserve was actually hiring developers so uh, to write code. So is, is there actually a design for what you're trying to build? Is this Death Star already built, or is it just under consideration? Uh, as I said, we've made no decision to move forward um, with a, a retail CBDC. If we did, we would seek authorizing legislation for that. Uh, we are conducting basic research to try and understand the technology and make sure that we wrap our arms around it. All right, thank you. Um, Acting Controller Sue, um, the 2021 interpretive letter 1179 issued by the OCC clarified your position that banks may provide digital asset custody services, hold stablecoin reserve deposits, and allow banks to use ledger technology and stablecoins to engage in payment activity. The OCC provided several firms conditional approvals which have now expired under your leadership. Can you comment on the impact of these expirations? Uh, what kind of impact have they had on banks and firms that invested in developing the ability to provide services to digital asset companies? Sure, thank you for, very much for the question. So um, our mission and our job is to ensure that all activities done in the federal banking system by national banks or federal savings associations is safe, sound, and fair. And that includes any crypto-related activities. Crypto, as you know, uh, has a number of risks associated with it. And so part of that interpretive letter was to, just to highlight there are some risks with that, if you or a national bank are going to engage in that, you have to demonstrate that it can be done safely and soundly and fairly. All right, um, we'll continue to have input on that. Obviously, uh, our committee's done some work on digital assets. We'd like to provide more clarity, uh, but you know, frankly, I would have liked to have seen the continuity that was there for in the space, and I think would have been great for our markets. Um, when you look at things that are good for our markets, uh, the FDIC and the Fed have both been busy uh, shoring up some of the credit risk that's been out there. Um, one of the things that has worked pretty well, you know, Ohio is home to almost half of the privately insured credit unions. Uh, are there plans to give them access to the bank term funding program that is available for banks, uh, but not credit unions currently? We, we do not have any plans to change the terms of the bank term funding program at this time. All right, thanks. I think the last thing I'd conclude on, Mr. Barr, really is for the Fed, you see, uh, you know, certain things that uh, the Federal, Federal Reserve's involved in heavily are the regulatory lane, of course, your lane. Uh, and this is a prudential bank regulator hearing, uh, you know, the four of you are lined up there. Uh, and I really feel like the function of the regulatory, prudential regulatory uh, activities of the Fed should be separated from the monetary policy functions. Uh, I think it should be clearly subject to appropriations. We're working on the Federal Reserve uh, Oversight Accountability Act that would do just that. And um, I, historically, folks who've held your role haven't favored that approach because it would provide more accountability to Congress and an actual appropriations process and whatnot. Um, but I guess, what's your take on that, that as a, a path? I think congressional oversight is, is absolutely essential. I would not uh, pursue the particular legislation that, that you've described. Thank you. My time's expired, and I yield. Well, I'll go to the gentleman from New York, the ranking Thank member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm concerned uh, about the impact that the Basel endgame proposal will have on access to mortgage options for first-time, minority, and low- to moderate-income home buyers. Vice Chair Barr, uh, during your testimony before the Senate Banking uh, Committee yesterday, you acknowledged that you are mindful of the concerns raised about the impact that risk uh, weight proposals could have on mortgage access for prospective black and brown homeowners who may be credit worthy, but may not be able to afford the traditional 20% down payment. How do you plan to address the potential intensification uh, of unequal access to mortgage credit for minority and LM, um, LMI uh, households brought on by the proposal? Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Meeks. We are in, in the middle of a, uh, a proposal phase. We're in the gathering of public comments. We're open to looking at all the ways that the rule uh, might be improved, in, including the ways that, that you've described. We very much welcome that public comment. We ask for uh, particular questions in the preamble of the rule uh, to make sure that we got good public comment on how to address that. We'll have to wait and see the actual comments and make an analysis and evaluation of those comments before making any decisions about uh, how the final rule should address it. But I, I very much hear the concerns and uh, appreciate uh, the public comment on them. And let me just also add on that because I also understand that if regulators make uh, targeted fixes to the proposal, I just want to bring up other issues that could come up, like that's less obvious uh, aspect of the proposal that could have similarly a dramatic effect uh, and consequences uh, on to mortgage access, because I'm concerned about mortgage access completely. For example, I'll give this as an example, banks, which often make affordable mortgages and go on to sell them to GSEs uh, for a fee, would be punitively treated by operational risk capital requirements associated with that income. So can you speak to that issue? The, um, the, the proposal uh, does uh, require operational uh, risk for a range of uh, market activities, including securitization uh, activities. The underlying credit um, with respect to mortgages uh, sold to Fannie or Freddie uh, does not change from, from current law. And we are, of course, am open to, to hearing concerns in this space, uh, as we are throughout the rule. And if there need to be adjustments, we know how to make those adjustments. So appreciate the comment. Yep, and I just would you know, hope that you could commit to conducting a truly holistic view, um, a, re a review, I should say, uh, that considers the impact of the proposal's risk weights and its operational risk requirements posed for affordable mortgage lending. I think that's tr tremendously important. Can you, can you do that? Yes, we, we are committed. I can speak for myself. We're, we're open to um, all kinds of comments on all aspects of the rule, including, including the one that you just made. And uh, Mr. Sue. You and uh, Vice Chair Barr both referenced the modernization of uh, CRA in your testimony. Uh, and I'm uh, curious how you view the intent of the new CRA interacting with the proposed changes to capital requirements. Um, well, I think about them separately in the sense that the purpose of the CRA is to really address redlining. And as you know, the law was passed in 1977 with the modernization is to really catch that up to where the banking system is today and how it operates. And uh, I think we feel pretty good that this final rule that we recently uh, adopted will help do that. I want to echo what Vice Chair Barr said with regards to the Basel proposal. Um, we understand, uh, we hear the concerns with regards to mortgages, and we are open to all the comments on that and making improvements uh, as warranted. I just want to just say it's absolutely key uh, and uh, essential. You know, there's so many individuals, uh, low and moderate income families, uh, great credit ratings, they just can't afford the 20% down payment. And to deny them that is to deny them the American dream and the access to create wealth because for most people, uh, that home is uh, the greatest investment that they will make and it is something that uh, helps reduce uh, the uh, income uh, gaps uh, and, and helps uh, in wealth. So I would hope that we make sure that you take every consideration as you're looking at the proposal to make sure that's included and not, uh, and, and not bypassed and not looked at because it's absolutely key for many Americans. And I yield back the balance of my time. I'll recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for taking time to be with us today. Uh, Mr. Barr, as I am sure you are aware, there are multiple Chinese entities that are members of the Basel Committee, such as the China Banking Regulatory Commission. Given that Chinese entities sit on the Basel Committee, how can we be sure that the government of China is not playing an outsized role in setting international standards that could ultimately be adopted by the Biden uh, administration appointed US regula regulators like yourself? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the United States participates in these organizations 
Uh, in, in general, those organizations operate by a broad consensus. Uh, if, if we found that there were any issues with respect to uh, international uh, approaches to an issue that we didn't think make sense in the United States, we would not implement them in the United States. Thank you for that perspective. Mr. Barr, the, the Basel Committee on Bank Supervision uses peer review processes to monitor whether jurisdictions are complying with the Basel Committee's recommendations. The federal banking agencies participate in these reviews. For example, the Federal Reserve is peer reviewed by officials from some foreign regulatory institutions for compliance. And the Federal Reserve devotes resources to participate in the compliance regime. Are you aware of any publications or reports from any of the federal banking agencies informing the public or Congress about this peer review process? I'm not sure I know the answer to the question. I'll have to get back to you. Thank you. Please, please do. It appears that the government has created moral hazard by encouraging banks to take more risk with deposits they receive given the decision to provide blanket deposit insurance for failed banks using the systemic risk exception. Mr. Greenberg, do you agree with that and can you explain why? Thank you, Congressman. That's a, that's a very important question, if I may say. I think. I think the answer is, is yes. The decision to protect those uninsured deposits at the two banks that failed <clears throat> in March was a um, consequential decision. Those were uninsured deposits. Those depositors made those deposits without an expectation of deposit insurance. The, uh, the law does provide authority to the Federal Reserve and the FDIC together with the Treasury in consultation with the President uh, to set that aside and protect those uninsured deposits if we believe there's a genuine risk to financial stability. And I think the fact is we had a tough judgment to make back in March, whether to not protect those uninsured deposits and run the risk of a contagion effect impacting other institutions with potential, potentially additional failures or to intervene utilizing this extraordinary authority uh, in a limited way for these two institutions. And I think the judgment was at the time that the financial stability risk was real, the, occasion, the contagion effect was impacting other institutions, and this was the prudent thing to do. Um, in retrospect, I, I think that was probably the right call. I think the system has stabilized since. I think there are consequences to that decision which is really why it's quite important for us to follow up um, in, in regard to a number of regulatory matters uh, to try to offset the moral hazard created by that decision. But it was a tough call, but in retrospect, I think the right decision to make. So in light of the regulatory failures that perhaps were made evident by those failures, what can we do? And, and so obviously, hopefully that leads to better more careful scrutiny going forward, but what other things might you all do to limit that moral hazard? Well, I mean, we learned some, some big lessons about uh, liquidity risk from this episode. I think we're now all quite focused on uh, supervisory attention to interest rate risk, to uninsured deposits, to accumulations of unrealized losses on the balance sheets of banks um, and uh, on rapid growth and uh, the need to escalate supervisory matters and to compel compliance if the circumstances require. So I think there are a number of supervisory actions we can take to mitigate the consequences of the decision. I do think I have may run it. The long-term debt rule to... Uh, thank you. If, if my time's expired, and so thank you for that answer. If you want to expand on it, we certainly would appreciate it for the record. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to our witnesses. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, I'm going to um, have another stab at doing something as quantitative as I can squeeze out of, of the panel here. 
Um, having to do with the, the Basel Endgame stuff. You know, you gave a speech in Nashville to the American Bankers Association recently where you had some, what I thought, very interesting numbers on this, where you started out, um, started out by uh, just, well, you ended up by concluding that the, um, that the proposed increase in capital standards would only amount to a rise of 1.5 to 3 basis points in the cost to fund each dollar of a typical lo loan portfolio. And so for those of you who are not, basis points are, uh, well, they're known to scientists as 10 to the minus 4 is one basis point. So three basis points is 0.03% for those who deal in percentages. Um, and, and so I was just wondering if you can sort of walk us through that, the chain of logic and the numbers that, that because I hear on one hand uh, that, oh, it's a 20% increase in the capital standards, and then somehow that ends up um, in your conclusion of your speech to one and a half to three basis points. So if you could sort of walk us through those numbers um, solely enough that we can follow the numbers, it would be great. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the question. So if you, if you take uh, overall the um, capital increases uh, in the proposal, they amount to about 200 basis points or, or 2%. Of that 2%, 30 basis points is okay, just attributable. So the 20% that gets quoted means it's 20% of the capital that's sitting around 10% now. Right, you can think so, the overall average increase is 16% of 12%, so about, about uh, 200 basis points. Right. So uh, of that 200 basis points, about 30 basis points are associated either directly with credit or with the operational risk that comes with credit provision. So that together is 30 basis points. That would be the increased risk-weighted assets, or you can translate it you know, into, into capital terms. Um, if you assume that the cost of equity is about 10 percentage points higher than the cost of debt. OK, now is, is, that, is that a standard assumption, or is that it, something made up? It's a conservative, a conservative assumption. You could say it's a little bit higher or a little bit lower, but it's a conservative assumption. So if, okay. you know, if debt were 4%, equity would be 14%. Okay, and that, so, that pretty much just comes from the fact that if a bank, you know, the bank can make the loan, but they can, you can force them to either issue equity instead of issuing debt. To, that's, that's correct. It's just so a that choice. The loan is funded. Prefer, yeah, banks prefer to issue debt because you pay interest, whereas equity, you pay dividends, and then there are tax implications and so on. So, that the, so that's a generally reasonable number, this 10% increase when you force them to issue new equity instead of new debt to that, issue a loan. Yes, that's, that's, that's correct. That's, okay. that's correct. So if you took 10% of 30 basis points, that's 0.03 percentage points. So a typical loan, an average loan in that portfolio would cost 0.03 percentage points more if there were no competition at all and the bank fully passed through that increased cost to the borrower. Okay, and so that in reality, I guess there's sort of two numbers there. This only applies to the biggest, um, you know, couple dozen banks. Yeah, the, the largest 37 banks. 37 banks, three dozen. Okay, and yeah, to a scientist level of accuracy. The, um, so that then presumably some of that business will just shift to smaller banks or to non-bank entities. Uh, it's, 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 so it's possible. It could be that some of the cost is passed through. It could be that competition forces the bank to internalize that cost. It could be that uh, some uh, smaller banks do more small business lending. Right, and then there's also the Mogliani-Miller effect, where it, presumably if a bank is forced to carry more capital, that whoever loans them money will charge them a smaller interest. Is that included in this, or is that another factor that will... That, that, is, that is not included in this calculation. So if, if you took a pure view, and said of the Mogdiliani-Miller theorem, you would say that the bank should be indifferent between debt and equity, and as equity grows, um, the, the debt becomes right. cheaper, but Understood. that's not in this calculation. Okay, and just in my last 20 or so seconds, yeah, I'm acting controller, Sue, um, you gave Mark's recent remarks uh, talking about your need to have visibility over not only third-party vendors, but deeper into the stack. Can you just say a few words about that? Sure. Um, so the banking system uh, and the provision of banking services is evolving quite a bit, and especially with regards to banks and non-bank partners like fintechs. And then the fintechs themselves also have partners. 
And so currently, um, we've got visibility, a lot of good visibility into bank fintech partnerships. And we recently put out some guidance in our agency uh, regarding best you know, risk management practices for that. But as the system evolves and this landscape evolves quickly, you do need to keep an eye on um, these longer chains, if you will, almost like supply chains for banking services to make sure that the banking system is safe, and sound, and fair. Gentlemen's time has expired. And um, we're, we're pushing up a hard stop. And uh, one third is a hard stop. We'd, we'd pledged. We've got members in the room still want to ask questions, I know, but we'll accommodate you the next hearing. Um, uh, and so we'll go to uh, Mr. Lucas, uh, the chair of the Science Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's a courtesy question. from one committee chairman to another. I yield whatever time you may need to well, you from me. I thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if, if you wanted to correct the record about compensation. Uh, have you attended any Bo uh, Bank for International Settlements meetings? Um, I, I have attended Basel committee meetings. Okay, yes. Basel. Okay. Um, we had an answer from Chair Powell that said the board uh, does receive certain payments uh, from the in this answer, Bank for International Settlements related to the attendance at Board of Directors meetings. I, I'm just trying to figure out what this is. is I, I apologize, sir. I don't, I don't know anything about so that. So you didn't, you didn't receive any compensation for your participation at Basel, no reimbursements from, from them uh, or compensation from them? Correct. I, I, okay. I don't know the BIS um, rules of procedure. Try to figure it out. That's why we ask. That's why we ask these questions. We'll have follow-up on that, obviously. Thank you. Chairman Lucas, yield back to you. In my remaining time, the Federal Reserve has maintained that U.S. banking system is sound and resilient with strong levels of capital liquidity, yet the Boswell endgame proposal is set to substantially raise capital requirements. That's been discussed here, which will increase cost and reduce access to capital. Chairman Powell even discussed in the Fed's a board meeting that the proposal exceeds what is required by the International Boswell Agreement and goes further than jurisdictions around the world. So Vice Chairman Barr, since the Boswell proposal has not been directed by Congress, is there a particular weakness in the banking system that this proposal is attempting to address? What are we trying to fix? Thank you very much. What, what we've experienced is that the risk calibration that is used for certain bank activities doesn't really match the kind of risk that we've seen in the past uh, through historical experience. That's particularly the case for things, for example, like uh, the trading desks and derivatives activities, where the risk calibration doesn't really cover tail risk from extreme events like those we saw in the global financial crisis. So the rule is tailored to try and address those kinds of risks. So when financial regulators implement massive policy changes under, under administration, it creates significant uncertainty in, with businesses and consumers. So again, Vice Chair, you've indicated that the final Boswell package will have broad support across the Board of Governors, and you have reassured the public that the Federal Reserve is a consensus-driven organization. After reviewing the comments and doing the appropriate revisions, is it your intention that the final rule have unanimous support of the Board? I, I, I can't promise what my fellow Board members um, would do. I, I hope to seek broad consensus across the Board but each individual governor, and of course the chair makes his or her own decisions about whether to support a rule or not support a rule. I'd like to shift my focus to one aspect of the Basel proposal, the impact on end users like small businesses and ag producers that employ derivatives to manage risk. The proposal would impose higher standardized capital requirements on derivative transactions despite Congress and this committee consistently acting in a bipartisan basis to protect derivative end users from increased cost. Uh, my colleague David Scott discussed this with you earlier today. It uh, seems like you're willing to study the impact on agriculture and the energy sectors. Will you commit to coordinating the analysis with CFTC and encouraging Congress, uh, engaging us throughout the process? And are you willing to make the appropriate revisions? We are uh, very open to comment, including from members of Congress and from uh, other agencies. Uh, we take those comments very seriously. Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, I've gone as far as I can go in the limited time, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Um, and without objection, I'd like to enter into the record letter initiated by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, to Chair Powell, Chairman Grunberg, and Acting Director uh, Sue regar regarding uh, the Basel, uh, Basel endgame. Um, and um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, our panel. 
uh, Vice Chair Barr, Chairman Grunberg, Mr. Sue, uh, Chairman Harper, uh, for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair. The questions will be forwarded to them for a response. I'd like to thank our witnesses um, and ask them to respond no later than December 15th. Um, and I would encourage the room uh, to take uh, conversations um, outside as we turn this room for our 2 p.m. hearing. Um, hope everybody has a, a nice Thanksgiving and uh, thank you all for your testimony, for your engagement. And I thank all the members uh, for accommodating this very long 10 week, uh, 10 week stretch Congress has been in session. Hopefully we'll come back uh, in better, in better uh, stead. Uh, with that, House is adjourned. Well, not the House. <laughs> <laughs> the committee is adjourned. <laughs>